Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson, the past brought to life by those who are there. This week, we've got the commander of the first American mission to go round the moon. All of a sudden, here in this total darkness was colour. The Earth was basically a blue marble with white clouds and sort of pinkish-brown continents you could see. Also, we remember two towering figures from the world of art, the film director Derek Jarman, he would say, I know nothing about acting. I'm not sure what I know about films. Of course, you see, he had such an engaging personality. It was just wonderful to meet a real rebel. And the Irish writer Samuel Beckett. Beckett was one of the few people I've ever met who just really knew that as long as he was alive, his purpose was to write. We'll get to that later. But first, we're going back to Italy in the late 1960s, when the country was riven by political violence from both left and right. Economic tensions and increasingly militant trade unions were tearing apart the fabric of Italian society. Acts of terror would be routinely blamed on extremists from either political wing, anarchists or neo-fascists. The government was also accused of running a strategy of tension, indirectly carrying out attacks on its own people through proxy right-wing activists. Anna O'Neill has been to Milan to hear about the true story behind one incident which inspired one of the playwright Dario Fo's most popular works, Accidental Death of an Anarchist. The incident in question was the tragic death of an Italian railway worker and anarchist, Giuseppe Pinelli, who fell to his death while in police custody. Now, Superintendent, think carefully. The report quotes you as having said, There are heavy suspicions pointing in his direction. Did you say that? Yes. In the beginning, later... The beginning. A good place to start, don't you agree? Uh, certainly. Thank you. Now, towards midnight, the anarchist, seized by a raptus, your words, threw himself out of the window, thus ending his life on the pavement below. Right. Exactly right. Correct. To the last detail. The play may have been a comedy, at least on the face of it, but it was based on a tragedy, the arrest and death of an innocent man for a crime he didn't commit. In Italy, the time between the 1960s and the 1980s was a period of social and political turmoil, marked by a wave of both left-wing and right-wing political violence. The Milan bank bomb of 1969, a typical act of random terror. Sixteen people were killed and dozens injured. Responsibility was immediately pinned upon an extreme left-wing group. But after years of judicial wrangling, it became clear that neo-fascists were really to blame. It was on the 12th of December 1969 that a bomb went off in a bank in Milan's Piazza Fontana. A local member of the Black Cross anarchist group, Giuseppe Pinelli, known as Pino, was one of a number of suspects rounded up and taken for questioning to the city's police headquarters. His daughters Claudia and Silvia remember the evening their father was arrested. That night we came back, me and Claudia, the door was completely wide open. The police were there and they were searching the apartment. There were papers all over the floor, the cupboards were open, the Christmas presents were open and on the floor. Claudia ran right in and wanted to chat to them because it was so normal that people were round at the house. But my mum stopped her saying, no, they are policemen. That was when my mother told us Daddy had been stopped but that he would be home soon. But we never saw him again. Silvia and Claudia were nine and eight years old in 1969 the only children of Licia and Pino. We had a house, a little council house in the San Siro area, but because Licia worked from home typing up letters for students on her typewriter, there were lots of people coming and going. My father was always ready to talk to anyone. He'd actually bought a wooden sign on which I'm an anarchist was written so that he could bring it up in conversation with people who came round. There weren't many other anarchists who came to our house, friends of my father. These were university professors or students, also dissenting Catholics whom my father met because he was a conscientious objector to military service and in those days only anarchists were conscientious objectors. And then Catholics also started objecting. They got together over common themes such as non-violence, being anti-military, being conscientious objectors to military service. Consider that being a conscientious objector carried a prison sentence. It was illegal. It was a battle because those were the people at the time who organised hunger strikes or peace marches with Pino. 
War had been over for 20 years and there was a real hope that a different kind of society was possible. But what does being an anarchist mean? I asked the Pinelli sisters what it meant to their father. For our father, anarchy was a sort of responsibility towards other people. My father, before he was brought into the police station for questioning on the 12th of December, he wrote a letter where he says, anarchy isn't violence, we reject it, and we don't want to be subjected to it. Anarchy is reason and responsibility. When it all happened, that was what I asked my mother. She said to us, your father has been stopped by the police. Why did they stop him? Because he's an anarchist. It was the first time we'd ever heard this word. And we asked her, what does being an anarchist mean? And she said, to love freedom. And maybe for me, this, as an answer, is the one that stays with me. In 1969, the authorities needed someone to blame for the Piazza Fontana bombing and they chose Milan's anarchists. Eventually, in 2001, three neo-fascists were convicted of the bombing and Pinelli's name was cleared. But what has never been established is exactly what happened on the 15th of December 1969 when Pino Pinelli was seen to fly out of the fourth floor window of the police headquarters and no one has ever been brought to justice for his death. Our life was never the same. Before, our house was always full of people. Now, suddenly, it was empty. Our mother, who had always been there, was now never there. She was out working or seeing lawyers, and in the evening she was cutting out articles from the newspapers. She kept every single article from the newspapers right up until now. Even the letters that arrive, both the anonymous ones and the letters of solidarity. Even the threats. When Pino died, we were sent to stay with friends. Then Leach's brother, our uncle. Then we came back to Milan and stayed with Pino's sister. We came back home after a long time away. Christmas had been and gone, but outside our door there were parcels. There were people who had come right up to our door and left presents for us. And letters, and even nasty letters. And out of all this, I remember a letter from a girl in primary school. She had sent me a drawing of Mickey Mouse. The fact that Leach has saved everything means that we've got everything documented. And that's important because we are carrying forward an historic truth in place of any legal truth. In the play, Dario Fo set out to demolish the official version that Pinelli had somehow accidentally thrown himself from the fourth floor window. La morte verrà archiviata come morte accidentale. The death was recorded as an accidental death. And this rapid closing of the case was what pushed Dario Fo to write Accidental Death of an Anarchist. He had collected all the contradictions, all the lies, the clerk's reports, the newspaper articles, the official police interviews. This is what made both Dario Fo and his wife Franca Rame write this play. And for the play, they were taken to court themselves more than 40 times. I'm here now in Piazza Fontana, just at the back of the Duomo in Milan, the cathedral. And this is where the bomb that killed 17 people went off and was the event that led to Giuseppe Pinelli losing his life at the police station three days later. And there are two memorials here to Pinelli. Both of them look very similar with very similar wording. There's a slight difference. One of them has been laid by the Comune di Milano, the, the local council, and it says to Giuseppe Pinelli... Railway worker, anarchist, an innocent who died tragically in the grounds of the police station in Milan on the 15th of December 1969. And the other memorial plaque has been laid by students and Milanese Democrats. And it says, to Giuseppe Pinelli, railway worker, anarchist, an innocent killed in the grounds of the police station in Milan on the 15th of December 1969. And that difference is telling because there's still a debate about how Pinelli died. And that's why Pinelli's daughters are still fighting for the truth about what happened to their father. 
Anna O'Neill in Milan, and you can see a photo of the Pinelli family in happier times before his death, including his daughters Sylvia and Claudia, on our website. Just search for BBC Witness. With me now is Donald Sassoon, Professor of Comparative History at Queen Mary University of London. Let's go back to Pinelli himself, first of all. Just describe the atmosphere in Italy that he found himself in as he became politically aware and indeed politically active. Well, the year in which uh, the uh, terrorist attempt on Piazza Fontana, which killed 16 people and for which he was arrested, occurred in 1969. In 1969, Italians know this as l'autunno caldo, or uh, the hot fall, the hot autumn, because the wave of strikes was unprecedented. And so it was an extremely difficult period in which tension was extremely high. When the uh, bomb exploded on Piazza Fontana, which is in Milan, just behind the cathedral, there was a wave, as one can imagine, there was a wave of uh, alarm, and uh, the police was under enormous pressure to arrest someone, and so they arrested poor Giuseppe Pinelli, who we now know had absolutely nothing to do with it. Was it a case, though, of um, tension for all Italians in the 1960s, the late 1960s, or was it more a case of factions, trade unions, extremists on left and right going after specific people or targets that represented something that they opposed. I mean, was there uh, a palpable sense of danger for all? Well, it's never for all. Um, the, uh, you know, the traffic accident killed, as usual, more Italians than uh, all the bombs in the world. Um, but certainly there was an atmosphere of a country which... Um, was worried about where it was it was it was going. Uh, one should also say that uh, there were terrorist attacks on both by both the left and the right. Uh, but the main difference is that attacks from the right tended to be um, ter generic terrorist attack on crowds. Um, there was a later one on a train, then one on a, at a Bologna station, and this went on. These were right-wing terrorists. The left-wing terrorists targeted specific people, particular people, sometimes trade unionists, which they regarded as not left-wing enough, uh, or journalists. Um, and eventually, the uh, left-wing terror uh, arrived at kidnapping one of the most important politicians in Italy, Aldo Moro, keeping him... Uh, um, kidnapped for um, 55 days and then finally killing him and dropping him in a car between the headquarters of the Italian Communist Party and the Christian Democratic Parties, which the left-wing terrorists thought were the same sort of uh, ruling class elite. We talk about um, <laughs> extreme groups on left and right, but was there a strategy of tension on the part of the government? Did the government actively foment some of this? I don't think the government had anything to do with it, but obviously people tried to explain uh, what was going on by attributing uh, to the government a complicated so-called strategy of tension. The idea was that by creating panic, the government then would be entitled to take uh, severe repressive measures and uh, dragging, transforming Italy from a uh, democracy, faulty though it may be, into a um, despotic and authoritarian state. Well, this did not occur. Other people also blamed the Americans, as they would often do, um, the secret services and so on. When things like that happen, conspiracy theories abound. And the left-right tension in Italy, it didn't stop at the end of the 1960s after incidents like those you've described. No, on the contrary, it uh, developed, uh, if you like, Piazza Fontana and the Pinelli thing was the beginning of a wave of terrorism, the anni di piombo, the years of lead, which lasted throughout the 70s and for part of the 1980s even. Professor Donald Sassoon from Queen Mary University of London, many thanks for your time.